Jason Wright, who is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State. He is a member of the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds and the director of the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. As you can see, Penn State has really taken a strong stand in this field, and, and Jason is a real leader there. Uh, he works on a variety of problems related to stars, planets, life in the universe, and his work in SETI includes searches for extraterrestrial industry via waste heat, like Dyson spheres or other technosignatures. And he's been a leader in the development of curricula for the field so that we can you know, educate uh, new students. Uh, he'll be speaking today about the search for extraterrestrial life and technology. Hey, Jason. Um, so this is an overview of technosignatures. I'm going to kind of give the, the, the 30,000 foot view of uh, what technosignatures are and how they fit in to our search for life in the universe. And I'll make a, a bit of an argument that they should be at least on par with biosignatures in terms of our search strategy for finding life elsewhere uh, in the universe. So let's start with definitions. The, this term technosignatures, uh, we, uh, it, was, it was coined by uh, Jill Tarter, who's right here, I see on the participant list, uh, in 2006, um, as a term to be analogous to biosignatures. That is any sign of extraterrestrial technology that lets us know that we have detected life. Um, most people use the term, I think, inclusive of radio or laser searches for communicative signals. Um, so it's really an umbrella term. I think that's how Jill originally uh, intended it uh, in her paper. Um, but we can also uh, consider them, some people like to consider them as being complementary um, uh, to, well, I'm sorry, some, many, I consider them to be complementary to biosignatures. Others consider them to be a subset of biosignatures. I think Heather's talk just now gave a great example of why it's useful to think of technosignatures as a subset of biosignatures because biology produces them. In my talk, I will see them as a contrasting or complementary approaches and I think you'll see why. I don't think either one is wrong. We just you know, use them as is useful in the context. So let's not, let's not quibble over that, I think. Um, another really useful term that's come in lately that I'm gonna use is the ichnoscale from the Greek word for work. Um, Hector Sokos Navarro coined this last year. I think it's really valuable. It's a quantification of the scale of a technosignature. So if you want to think about something humanity does or something an alien species might do uh, that produces technosignatures, you think how big is the technosignature? It might be the physical size of an object. It might be the duty cycle or ubiquity or strength of a radio transmission. But it's all just normalized such that humanity's technologies have an ICNOS scale of one. And so we can ask for any technosignature we're looking for, how much bigger or stronger or more ubiquitous must it be than Earth's humanity's technosignatures for us to have a reasonable chance of detecting it? And that's uh, that tells you what the ICNOS scale needs to be for it to be a useful technosignature. So an enormous project like a Dyson sphere or something might have an ICNOS scale of 10 to the 12 or something very large. And so that requires an enormous amount of extrapolation for it to work. Um, other technosignatures might only need an ICNOS scale of one for us to be able to detect it, which is kind of a threshold, I think, for plausibility. Um, so the ideal technosignature would only need an ICNOS scale of one for us to be able to detect it, because then we're really looking for analogies to ourselves. Um, there's the term SETI, which I really like as a term for the whole field. That was originally the name of the radio program at NASA. Um, I think now it's used much more generally as the field, the study of searching for technosignatures. Um, there are other versions of this floating around. Uh, the old Soviet program was SETI with the C for communication. Um, people have also suggested SET T, Freeman Dyson liked that, meaning technology. Jill has said if we're looking for radio signals, we're not looking for intelligence, we're really looking for electrical engineers. Amusingly, all four of these are pronounced the same way, SETI, so you can kind of get away with it. Um, there's also an older term, the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, which I think now is kind of a subset of SETI. At any rate, I think SETI as the field overall is the way we're mostly using the term now. But again, let's not really quibble. I'm gonna use SETI and the search for technical signatures interchangeable. So um, there are a couple of foundational ideas in SETI um, that are often misunderstood, I think. Um, one is the Fermi paradox. So originally, uh, this supposedly comes from a lunch in 1950 uh, at 
uh, where Fer Enrico Fermi asked his lunch partners, where is everybody? And this was in the context of the idea that, um, that alien life might be throughout the galaxy, the, uh, the, the, the Roswell incident and UFOs were kind of on people's minds. And, um, uh, and he was just really asking, you know, why aren't they here right now? He was doing a, a mental Fermi calculation about how long it would take them to get here and how many would be in the galaxy. And it's not a formal paradox. It's not even really Fermi's. He just asked this question and a reporter later attached the idea to this incident. Um, if you want a detailed account, Bob Gray has a really nice article on, on how it's kind of grown. But it's fundamentally about why aliens aren't here on Earth today since they've had a lot of time to get here. And it's an interesting question. It has a lot of answers. Um, and so it's not really necessarily a paradox or a puzzle that has to be answered. Um, really, it was articulated in the 70s and the 80s by Hart, Tipler, Viewing, um, Tchaikovsky, and others. Um, so sometimes it's called the Hart-Tipler paradox or the argument or something like that. Um, so by extension, you often hear it referred to um, referring to the failure of SETI so far to detect anything. And that's the paradox. Why haven't we found anything? But that, that clearly can't be what Enrico Fermi was talking about because SETI wouldn't even start for another nine years with Project Osmo. Um, he just meant why they aren't here today. So that's kind of an, an analogous extension, a figurative use of it. Um, but that's not really formally what it's about. That The fact that we haven't heard anything yet, the fact that we haven't found anything yet, you might better call the great silence, the eerie silence, uh, as Paul Davies likes to call it, but this really isn't surprising. Um, uh, Jill Tarter likes to talk about the nine dimensional haystack and we did a more formal calculation to try and figure out how much searching have you done? How much would you really um, need to search to have a good chance of finding things that are out there? Um, and uh, in this nine dimensional space that you can look for, different frequencies, different duty cycles, different directions that you can look, different amounts of time you can look, the sensitivity you need to detect different things, um, you have a very large volume. And Jill calculated that to date, um, it would, uh, the, 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 it, you could imagine there's the whole ocean, that's your search volume, and you're looking for fish. You want to know if there are fish in the ocean. And, you know, there's a lot of fish. You don't have to drain the oceans to find a fish. Um, but also you need to look in a significant amount of water. And she calculated that to date, people had looked through about a drinking glass worth of water. And you would not be surprised for an open ocean teeming with fish if a single glass didn't contain one. We did a modern calculation that takes into account modern surveys, including the breakthrough listen radio search. And we concluded we're up to like a hot tub, basically, out of the entire ocean. So, you know, if it's teeming with fish, we might, you know, be at the point where we can find something. But the fact that we haven't found anything is not as positive. It doesn't prove um, it, that things are silent. It doesn't present a puzzle to be solved. Um, the next foundational idea is the Drake equation. Here's Frank himself uh, with the, the famous Drake equation. I won't go through all the terms here now. I'll just say that it calculates n the number of signals that there are to find. Uh, as an average, based on the number of stars, the number of star uh, planets around those stars, the fraction of those um, planets that can have life, and then the fraction that do something technological, and then the amount of time that they do that technological thing. And once you whittle all of that down, that gives you n. This is a classic um, Fermi calculation for an order of magnitude. Um, this has had many variations and reformulations in the literature. Fundamentally, it's a heuristic for parameterizing our ignorance. We don't know those values, but it lets us focus on the things that maybe we can work on. And so since he wrote that down, we've learned about the planets uh, around other stars. We're starting to get a good handle on how many might have life on the surface. And even through astrobiology uh, on the bio side, we started to learn more about the origin of life and maybe getting to the next term. But we're not going to get all the way to the end anytime soon. In the end, this is um, being used as a justification for the search to show that N could be quite large, which is all you really need to do SETI. It's not a useful way of doing better than order of magnitude calculations because the uncertainties in the latter terms are so large. And uh, amusingly, it had not been properly cited that I could find anywhere in the literature until recently. So the next time you cite it, please cite Frank's paper from 1965, which is now on ADS. Um, Freeman Dyson was another uh, founder of, of the field. He, his paper on Dyson spheres came out in the same year 
uh, or within a year of the announcement of Project Ozma and the Coconi and Morrison paper for Radio SETI. Um, one of his phrases that really resonates with me is that every search for alien civilizations should be planned to give interesting results even when no aliens are discovered. And this somewhat reflected his bias in it that, that you know, he, he wanted all of these things to um, have secondary applications. Um, but I think it's a good thing to keep in mind, but maybe a better way to phrase it is from Frank himself. Um, he said, any project aimed at the detection of intelligent extraterrestrial life should simultaneously conduct more conventional research. Perhaps it should be about 50-50, divided equally between conventional research and intelligence signal search. And from our experience, this is the arrangement to most likely produce the quickest success. And there's a lot of reasons for this, um, but the connect reason I bring it up now is that what we can do a lot of searches for technosignatures and biosignatures simultaneously. These cannot just be complementary in our search strategies, but they can actually um, be synergistic. And we can use the same instruments and the same measurements in some cases to look for both. And as we heard in the previous talk about agnostic biosignatures, even our methods, even the things that we think we're looking for might be equally sensitive to biosignatures and technosignatures. And so um, I think this just emphasizes uh, how these two search strategies can work together. So um, a while back, I tried to put all of the bio and technosignatures uh, under a common umbrella. And this is what I came up with. Um, we're all looking for life through astrobiology uh, and biosignatures uh, at the you know, moment definitely occupy a bigger space. Um, but I was talking about technosignatures. So the balance here with biosignatures being narrow is just because um, th my talk is about technosignatures. Um, so with biosignatures, we know we might want to look for things on exoplanets, atmospheric gases, maybe surface reflection spectra. And in the solar system, we can do things in C2, which is wonderful. We might find microfossils, for instance, in a Martian meteorite. We might find molecular biomarkers, something like phosphine on Venus, or maybe something in the plumes of Enceladus, some sort of um, you know, evidence of chemical disequilibrium that shows that there's some kind of metabolic processes going on. Um, in technosignatures, we have a really wide range because technology can do so many different things. Um, and so there are kind of uh, a few categories. I want to focus on the first two uh, in this talk because I think they're the more uh, fruitful ways forward and most connected to this workshop. Um, the first is communication. Um, this would mean radio signals. Uh, it could also mean lasers. Uh, both are, are um, very effective ways at communicating. We use those to communicate across the solar system and uh, they have a lot of advantages. The other is what I call artifact SETI, which is basically looking for anything else. You're looking for physical objects. You're looking for the radiation they put off, the radiation they block. You're, you're looking for whatever technology they produce. This is basically anything that isn't used for communication. Some people like this better because it doesn't Im uh, imply so much um, agency on the part of the alien species to be trying to get our attention. Um, along those lines, like, you know, what technosignature should we look for? People put forward lots of reasons why their preferred technosignature is the most likely one to get discovered. And Sophia Sheikh, a couple of years ago, um, compiled all of these different arguments for why you should look for certain things and came up with nine different reasons people put forward for, for, for looking for a particular technosignature. The first four here in orange are, are about us. What, what can we plausibly detect? There's no point looking for something that we have no chance of detecting. But the bottom five are mostly about them. It's about the, um, uh, the, the, the activity that we're talking about. So for instance, the second from the bottom is commonly invoked. Um, some technosignatures require a lot of contrivance. You have to get into their heads, you've got to do your xenopsychology and imagine exactly what it is they would do. So for instance, maybe you want to guess what frequency they would transmit at. And so now, you know, you're trying to understand what would they guess that I would guess that they would guess they would transmit at. Um, nowadays, we can search for many frequencies at once. We don't have to do that much. And so that kind of radio searching is much less contrived than it was in the, in the past. The best techno signatures will be completely inevitable, something that all technology does. For instance, all technology in some way manipulates energy. And much technology is going to collect, use energy, and then dispose of it because you have to conserve energy. And so that is a highly inevitable techno signature to look for energetics. The question is, is there enough that you can detect it? So um, let me start 
with uh, communication SETI, just because this is an overview and I want to just give kind of the basics here. Um, in principle, communication SETI could happen over almost any carrier that can travel among the stars. The electromagnetic spectrum seems the most obvious, seems to have the most going for it. Um, it can travel long distances. We know how to detect it. Um, we can see galaxies at the edge of the universe. Photons are great. Neutrinos, people have suggested, and who knows, maybe. The big advantage is they go right through everything, and so nothing can block them. The disadvantage is they go right through everything, and so your detector won't stop them. And so um, it's a you know it's a possibility, and it's something we should keep in mind. Gravitational waves have been suggested again. They go right through everything. They're extremely hard to detect. Just for scale, the faintest ones that we can detect are generated um, by events that consume solar masses c squared of energy in a fraction of a second. And so you need a lot of energy to make anything we could detect. But still, we should be keeping an open mind on what an alien species might do. Cosmic rays might be another one. They travel a long way. Again, the advantage over electromagnetism is not obvious. We, we think EM is probably the best. It's where I would put the vast majority of our resources if it were up to me. Um, the difficulties primarily are just one over R squared. The, international, you know, the, the interstellar distances are just so big that they get weak very quickly. Um, and the other is discrimination from background. There's a lot of photons out there and it's not a useful communication if the photons that you're interested in are just getting lost in the noise. Um, it, uh, the, the communication study in general has the strong advantage that detections could be completely uh, unambiguous. And that's really nice. Um, a completely unambiguous detection uh, would mean that you had uh, discovered life, that you'd gone straight up to the very top of the ladder of life, life detection all at once. Um, and then you could start studying it immediately. Um, I just want to emphasize the, how, why it's so unambiguous. Um, it's because if you compress an electromagnetic freak, uh, signal in frequency or in time, um, it can stand out from the background. And that makes it much more detectable if, you're, if um, your, your, your instrument can uh, resolve it. Um, it also is something nature cannot do. All natural signals have a finite bandwidth um, because the particles that generate the signal have motion. And so that generates a Doppler shift. And so you cannot have arbitrarily narrow band natural signals. All natural signals also have some finite time. Now there are a few funny exceptions like what produce fast radio bursts for instance. Um, but in general, we can tease those out. Um, basically something with a finite size that radiates isotropically can't give off a signal that's briefer than the light travel time across the object. And so that leaves a very narrow set of um, ranges where uh, you could um, uh, generate a narrow signal naturally. And so looking for time and frequency compressed signals uh, is a great way to overcome both difficulties. So if you see it, it's basically got to be technological. Um, leakage. The, the, Communication doesn't have to be intended for us. Um, they could be communicating with each other. They could be, you know, we, our radio waves leave Earth and head off and in principle could be detected at interstellar distances. And so it's, it's not that contrived to look for communicative signals because it doesn't necessarily mean they're trying to get our attention. Um, in principle, for instance, the full square kilometer array uh, may have the sensitivity to detect our own leaked radio emissions out at four parsecs. And so ICHNOSCALE 1 is achievable with the full square kilometer array. Um, and so it's much harder to spot things that aren't beamed directly at you, but they're less contrived. And so you get to, you get to slide the sliders on Sophia's axes of merit in a way that, um, that, is, um, that, that I think favors detection. On the other hand, because leakage is so weak, if you wanted to find it around a distant star, you need this enormous extrapolation from our current technology. So it's only you know, with future technology of ours at the very closest stars that you don't need that big technology um, extrapolation. By contrast, directed communication at us could be done with Earth 2020 technology. We are capable of sending a signal today that we are capable of detecting at great interstellar distances across the galaxy. Okay, so that's communication SETI. You're probably the most familiar with that. Um, artifact SETI uh, is everything else. So this once, this term once only meant solar system work, looking for Bracewell probes. Um, but now we kind of use this much more generally. 
Um, an artifact could be very long lived is a big advantage to it. Um, a communicative signal in general, we imagine will only last as long as they're interested in sending it, whereas artifacts can outlast um, their creators. So some artifact SETI possibilities, I made this chart a while ago, we could look for the first row structures, we can look at the second row environmental changes, we can look at the third row uh, excess heat from energy, we can look in the solar system for these things, we can look at exoplanets for these things, uh, and we can even look around stars or among the stars for each of these things. And all of these things here are techno signatures that have been proposed in the literature as things we can look for, and most of these have not been looked for. This is a very young field. Most of the money that has gone in to this field since it started has been in communication study. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. And there's a lot of things that we can go looking for. I'll talk about just a few of these uh, next. Um, uh, well, actually I'm gonna focus, I guess, on, on atmospheric techno signatures as an artifact we can look for. Perhaps because it has the, the, the tightest connection to searches for biosignatures. So this was actually only proposed um, uh, recently. I think there was like one paper in the 70s, one in the 80s, and then very recently people have really gotten into this as uh, we've thought about transmission spectroscopy for biosignatures. And so when we're taking our spectra of these exoplanets and analyzing their atmospheres, um, we are looking for biosignatures, but we may see things that we don't recognize, or better, that we do recognize as distinctly technological and not biological. And so this is a great example of that, of, of, of doing you know, that, that synergy between the two searches. Many artificial gases have no significant abiogenic source. And uh, that's, it's not you know, impossible to conceive of biology that could do it. But again, if you see such a gas, you know it's technological or perhaps biological, but either way, that's a win, right? We found life. So um, this is something I think we should be taking very seriously. So just as two examples, because they're the only two that have been worked out as far as I know, let's look at CFCs and NOxes. So um, we recently submitted a paper uh, led by Jacob Hawk Misra, um, uh, with Ravi Koparapu and others, looking at whether you would be able to detect chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere of TRAPPIST-1e with the James Webb Space Telescope. And the answer is in principle, but maybe not in practice. It's just a little too hard. But um, so the, 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 the one times, two times, five times you're seeing in this plot, that's the ICHNO scale. So blue would be Earth levels of CFCs. Um, and if uh, you could spend hundreds of hours of James Webb Space Telescope time staring at 1E e during transit, um, then uh, you might be able to build up a few sigma detection, depending on where the noise floor is uh, of that. And if you had an ICNA scale of five, it would not take as much time for you to build up a significant detection. And of course, if the ICNA scale were very large, if for whatever reason their atmosphere were full of CFCs, you would be able to detect it. And this is actually comparable, quite comparable, and even better than some biosignature relevant gases. And so this is a case where biosignatures and technosignatures are kind of on par with each other uh, for a detection around another planet. Now, this is an example. I'm not sure TRAPPIST-20 necessarily is the best place to look for technosignatures, but just an example that we're, we're really on par here in some cases. Another example would be NOxes. So um, nitrous nitrogen dioxide here, um, gets produced uh, when you have combustion. And in a nitrogen atmosphere, you make this NO2. Uh, and you can see here um, that uh, the NO2 emission uh, in, in the United States is highly, highly correlated with technology in two ways. One is spatially, big cities produce a lot of it, some do anyway. Um, and then both temporally, March, 2020, of course, cars and planes kind of stopped running and um, NO2 levels dropped across the country. So it's a clear techno signature, at least on Earth. And uh, uh, Jacob, uh, we showed in a, in a, in a or, uh, Ravi and Jacob and others uh, on this paper, uh, we showed that similarly, uh, in this case, you need something like a Louvre 15 meter. You can't do it with Webb uh, just because you know where the lines are exactly. Um, but if you looked at Earth around a sun-like star like Tau Ceti or something like that, um, and again, hundreds of hours with a very large space telescope, you could get an SNR of a few at ICNOS scale one. So if their NO2 levels are a thousand times higher, 
then it's actually something that we might be able to detect. So we've only measured it for these two so far. We need to build a library of others and see if there are some that we would be able to detect quite cleanly at Earth levels of technology. We also, of course, need to keep in mind, you know, we don't know what technological gases they might have in their atmosphere and be ready for surprises and to take a spectrum of a planet, say, what is that? And then figure out what it could be. The last one, which I think is really fun, is city lights. This is a clear techno signature. Is there any way we could detect it? Well, Thomas Beattie worked it out. And surprisingly, kind of, yeah. Um, so if we had a habitable zone rocky planet orbiting Tau Ceti, uh, and you could image it with a space telescope, and uh, you could look at the night side and compare it to the day side and look at the two spectra and try and, um, and, and understand um, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, this is just looking at the spectrum of the dark night side of the planet. Um, and the, the, at ignoscale zero, basically, you know, you just see the night side of the planet. At ignoscale one, you basically can't tell the difference. But ignoscale 2000, it's actually a clear detection uh, with Louvoir A, uh, with, a with a reasonable, I think, uh, maybe a lot of observing time. Now, at ignoscale 200 would mean that you covered the entire planet. Earth's land mass with city. This would be what we call an ecumenopolis. Um, and so maybe that's extreme, but the point is like, you know, it's there, it's not completely out of reach. And the scale isn't 10 to the 12, it's 10 to the two or 10 to the three. Um, and so uh, that's a possibility I didn't think was in range, but who knows, maybe that. So we're just starting to think of these things. We're just starting to put this stuff together. So um, I want to uh, uh, finish up by just thinking about this comparison between technosignatures and biosignatures. Um, I'm not thumbing my chest and saying technosignatures are better. I just want to break through any reticence you might have that technosignatures are necessarily a worse bet. Uh, and that intuition follows very naturally actually from the Drake equation. The Drake equation is wonderful. It has really helped shape the field. Um, but this is one way in which that intuition, I think, can lead us astray. And let me explain what I mean. The Drake equation here takes the number of stars you might look at, and then it winnows those down to the places where life starts. And then says that technosignatures will only be found around a small subset of those stars. And, if, um, and so the intuition that this builds is that there have to be fewer technosignatures than biosignatures because F sub I, the fraction of planets with life and presumably biosignatures that also have intelligence and therefore technolo technology has to be less than one. And so N technosignatures must be less than in biosignatures, but this is not correct. And the reason this is not correct is that this assumes that technological life does not spread. Um, if technological life spreads, then it's very possible that there could be way more sites of technosignatures than biosignatures by you know, 10 to the 10 or something like that. For instance, in the solar system, N biosignatures, at least obvious biosignatures, is one. It's just Earth. But N technosignatures is significantly higher. The moon, Mars, other planets, other places in the solar system have technosignatures that we can detect at interplanetary distances, and that another species might be able to detect interstellar distances. So right away, we see that NTech, the only case we know, the only system we have, in technosignatures signatures is actually greater than biosignatures. There's also a related idea that Manasvi uh, Lingam is putting together about what we're calling service worlds. This idea that a place like Mars could have technosignatures that are that far exceed the biosignatures even in the far future because there is no biosphere to worry about competing with. On Earth, our technosignatures can only get so large before we start threatening the biosphere. If there is no biosphere, then technosignatures have no limit to how strong they could be. You could imagine, I don't know, covering Mercury with solar panels and supercomputers. If there's no biosphere there, why not? Now, I'm not advocating such a thing and I'm not you know, I'm not trying to promote any worldview of, you know, conquering the galaxy or anything like that. We're just talking about the ceiling. How big could techno signatures get? And there could be many more of them and they could be much stronger than biosignatures throughout the galaxy. Um, and so such worlds could have ichnoscales far in excess of anything uh, we do here on Earth. Um, so um, let me argue that this could happen quite quickly. This is essentially the Fermi paradox, and I'm going to basically do the thought experiment that 
Fermi did in 1950. Um, let's assume spreading to stars is very rare. It's, um, it only happens every 100,000 years that a, a species has technology. And then you no know warp drive. You just go to the very nearest star system. So, you know, we can get to Proxima and Alpha Centauri and, you know, not all the way even to Tau Ceti or something like that. Um, and let's say we're only going with chemical propulsion and gravitational slingshots. So this is a 300,000 year journey or something like that. So that that's like, you know, minimal. This is like conceivably within humanity's grasp in the next few centuries. Well, if you do that and you set up long lived species, and this is a, um, a simulation that we did uh, of the galaxy with Jonathan Carroll Nallenbach and others at University of Rochester and elsewhere, here the red dots represent places that have been settled. And we've had to scale things up in the galaxy to keep the numbers right, but the, the quantitative rate of spread is correct in this scaled model of the galaxy. And what happens is because the stars are mixing, because the galaxy is super old, in less than a billion years, you take over the galaxy with new settlements. So the idea is you go to a new place, you wait 100,000 years, you send off another one. The other effect that you see here um, is that when the, where the stars are closer together at the center of the galaxy, it's much easier to go because there's more stars in range. And so it goes very quickly. Um, so that's the Fermi paradox. That only took a billion years with super conservative assumptions. Why hasn't it happened? Anyway, what I'm saying is perhaps it has and techno signatures are everywhere to be found. The next um, one that, that the Drake equation, uh, I think slightly misleads us on is the L factor there, the longevity of techno signatures. And we often imagine that this must be very short. After all, our techno signatures have only been around for optimistically, you know, decades. If you want to think radio, maybe if you think of land surface change as thousands of years or something. But at any rate, much, much smaller than biosignatures. And so you would think that um, the length of time intelligence is around has to be less than that of life. And that this would argue that biosignatures has to be greater. But again, there are hidden assumptions here, which often go unchallenged, but once you think about them, um, it turns, you know, th th this is not correct. First of all, that's only true for Earth's past, that our techno signatures are short, and we can be pessimistic about our future, um, but we can also be optimistic. We're the first species that can prevent its own extinction. And even the cataclysms we are concerned about, like global thermonuclear war, or catastrophic climate change, they only stop L if humans go extinct. Like, you know, civilization collapses, we're still here, we're still modern humans, we can still build tools, we can come back. Uh, and Frank made this point in his original paper. Um, and so even if you're pessimistic about humanity, it's not obvious that L is always going to be so short. Um, also, there are other tool using intelligent species. So even if we go extinct, that doesn't mean that intelligence is gone from the surface of the earth. Um, also, even if you think that we're especially self-destructive and that L we are going to go extinct and maybe make all intelligent life on Earth extinct, it doesn't follow that that's a universal property of alien species. And if other alien species don't have that tendency, then looking at humanity as a guide for what L should be is incorrect. So it's in fact very reasonable to hypothesize that as an upper limit, L sub I could be much longer than L life. We don't know. I'm not arguing it is. I'm just saying that looking at Earth is a bad guide to figuring out if it is or not. And it could be much longer. In principle, humanity could outlive the biosphere. Why not? Um, so there's two more ways that we might want to compare biosignatures and technosignatures. One is ambiguity. I've already argued many uh, technosignatures are unambiguous. Many are quite ambiguous, Dyson spheres and things like that. Maybe, um, you know, how do you know that's really a CFC in the atmosphere of that planet? But that's also, of course, a major problem for biosignatures. And as we said, some technosignatures are completely unambiguous. Um, and so I would say that one's basically a draw where technosignatures have a, a higher ceiling they could in principle be much more unambiguous. And finally in strength, um, this is where I think this, the ICNO scale idea really helps us think about these. Most biosignatures are very subtle or weak. They're hard to detect even at earth levels. Technosignatures have no upper limit. They can be almost arbitrarily strong because technology can harness as much energy as you're willing to put the effort into collecting. In fact, earth's technosignatures are already probably more detectable than its biosignatures. 
This has not been properly quantified. We are working on it, but I think it is true that if you were on Alpha Centauri and wanted to prove there was life orbiting the sun, your best bet is to find our radio emission because detecting Earth's biosignature when it's not a transiting planet is extremely challenging. We can almost do the radio now. I don't think we're as close to detecting the biosignature in reflected light. Um, and it doesn't take much. A 10 kilowatt laser on a telescope can outshine the sun. A one, a one megawatt radar pulse is detectable at you know, far beyond the nearest, um, uh, the nearest star system. And the Breakthrough Starshot laser, this idea of building a giant phased array of extremely powerful lasers, um, something like that, which we can design even if we don't build it, is actually visible across the universe. So the sky really is the limit when it comes to technosignature strength. Um, and then, uh, so to sum up all of that, um, technosignatures could in principle easily be more long-lived, they could be more abundant, they could be more unambiguous, and they could be more detectable than biosignatures. So I think it's important to be part of the overall portfolio. And I'm really excited about the synergies that come from looking from both at the same time. Uh, so I think we should go check. And so with that, uh, I will uh, take any questions and see what's going on in the chat here. Wonderful, thanks, Jason. That's a, a great overview and also very thought provoking. I'm, I'm glad the arguments you give at the end are very thought provoking I think, for this audience. Uh, Sorry. Let's uh, see question. Uh, oh, yeah, from Ellie. No, and the annual scale of breakthrough star shot. Um, it's got to be huge because we generally don't shoot lasers into space. I think most of the lasers we shoot into space are probably like um, adaptive optics lasers and perhaps laser uh, optical communication with satellites. I would guess those are the strongest. Maybe you want to compare it to our city lights. Um, but the breakthrough star shot laser is visible across the universe. So it's 10 to the very large number, I would say, depending on how you want to calculate it. Yeah. For those that may not know, Breakthrough Star Shot is a program to develop the technology to basically use the lasers to accelerate a light sail to uh, Alpha Centauri to, to check it out. Um, David Grinspoon has a thing in the chat about the axis of merit being fruitfully applied to biosignatures and might be more appropriate than the proposed single variable scale that Jim Green mentioned earlier. Um, um, I have no opinion about whether it's better or worse than Jim Green's thing. Uh, I will say that it is deliberately qualitative. Um, I think like the Drake equation, it try, it's a heuristic to try and capture the, um, uh, the, the things that one needs to think about in the problem. Um, and I think it'd be interesting. It, I think it's a good exercise to try and put numbers on the scale, but I think ultimately we don't know what we're going to find. There are some things that seem extremely unlikely, some that seem more, but I don't think we can split hairs with it in the end. But yeah, I think, I think it should be widely used. Thank you.